same from the characteristic trichurus trichura or called the whip worm gets its name from its typical whip like structure it causes trichinolosis in humans an intestinal infection caused by the invasion of the mucosa of the colon by the adult worm it is a common intestinal parasite it lives in the large intestine mainly the cecum and the appendix adult worms gulo ke rokom dekhte hoy whip uh, whip shaped chobi eke dekhacche dara the anterior three fifth being long and the posterior three fifth being stout the anterior uh, the whip, uh, anterior three fifth being long thin and hair like and the posterior one fifth being short thick and stout they this, this remain attached to the mucus of the small intestine with their anterior ends erythro deeply embedded into the mucosa him anti male male lens ta koto 30 to 40 mm in length and it is recognized by a characteristic posterior end and the female measures 40 to 50 mm in length and is longer than the male ঠিক আছে ইট ইস ওভিপ্যারাস অ্যান্ড দ্য ফিমেল ইজ কেপেবল অফ লাইং ফাইভ থাউজেন্ড টু সেভেন থাউজেন্ড এগস পার ইয়ার সিদ্ধার্থ এই স্টুল কালচারের স্টুল ইয়েতে দেখবি যে রাহুল শুনছিস এই স্টুল স্টুল সুইসমেনে এই এগসগুলো আসে দেবার্ঘ এগস আর ব্যারেল শেপেড এগস এই ধরনের ব্যারেল শেপেড এগস উইথ নিউকাল প্লাস বোধ এন্ডস ইট হ্যাজ আ ডাবল লেয়ার অফ কোটিং অ্যান্ড দ্য আউটার লেয়ার ইজ বাইল স্টেন The eggs are barrel shaped, colorless with a mucous plug at both the ends, <laughs> yellowish brown and double shelled. Outer layer has a bile stain. Parasitology is on the same. This is the bile stain and non bile stain eggs. This is the same. 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 Bile stain eggs. They float in a saturated salt solution and each egg contains an unsegmented ovum. life cycle now coming on to the life cycle the life cycle of trichurus is simple completed in a single host the humans human kokhon infection acquire korche humans acquires infection by ingesting the soil containing embryonated eggs infection korche soil containing infected eggs the embryonated eggs hatch in the intestine and liberate the larva that penetrate the villi and continue to develop human host larva develops in the large intestine unembryonated eggs gulo ke feces er e korche feces e 10 theke 14 diner moddhe eglo embryonated eggs e convert मैच्योर male and female adults the female then lays eggs each adult female can lay 5000 to 7000 eggs per day for up to 5 years eggs gulo tokhon feces e chol unembryonated eggs gulo deposited hocche kintu unembryonated eggs gulo they develop in they, <coughs> deposited into the damp worm soil develop into embryonated eggs in 10 to 14 days the embryonated eggs containing the rhabditiform larva are infected humans তাহলে ইনফেক্টিভ ফর্ম কি আয়ুষ এগুলো ভাইভাতে জিজ্ঞেস করে এমব্রেনেটেড এগস কন্টেনিং দ্য র্যাবডিটি ফর্ম লার্ভা দ্য অ্যাডাল ফর্ম ইনভেস দ্য ইন্টেস্টিনাল মিউকোসা বাই এ থিন থ্রেড লাইক অ্যান্টিরিয়র এন্ড অ্যান্ড প্যাথোজেনেসিস তো কিভাবে আয়ুষ দ্য অ্যাডাল ফর্ম ইনভেস দ্য ইন্টেস্টিনাল মিউকোসা বাই এ থিন থ্রেড লাইক অ্যান্টিরিয়র এন্ড অ্যান্ড ফিজ অন দ্য টিস্যু সিক্রেশনস ইট কি কি কজ করছে ইট কজেস পেটেশিয়াল হ্যামারেজ ইনফ্লামেশন ইডিমা অ্যান্ড মিউকোসাল ব্লিডিং approximately 0.5 ml of blood per worm are lost daily tale main symptoms gulo ki hobe anemia and this also causes eosinophilia due to this allergic reaction 
The metabolic products of the worms produce allergic manifestations such as urticaria and respiratory distractions of the host. The clinical manifestations of trichuris depend upon the intestinal worm load of the person. Most infections are asymptomatic. Infections with 100 to 200 worms, they work out, produce live infection. And infections with more than 200 worms produce heavy infection. Heavy infections are seen in small children who play with a lot of dirt. This condition manifests as vague abdominal discomfort, diarrhea occasional with blood and mucus, and retardation of growth. Heavy infections with more than 800 worms can cause anemia, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and dysentery and weight loss. The migrating worms can also cause sometimes appendicitis. Congenital Epidemiology Epidemiology About 800 million people are infected worldwide. It is common in the underdeveloped countries. Trichuris infection is commonly found in tropical and subtropical countries with the moist and warm soil. This is very common in tropical Africa, South America, and Southeast Asia. Laboratory diagnosis ki bhabe korbo amra? Laboratory te ki bhabe pabo? Obviously, stool, uh, stool passage kore, stool culture kore dekhte pabo ki dhabe, ki dekbo? The demonstration of these characteristics, barrel shaped eggs in the feces by light microscopy. Sometimes stool concentrations or methods are taken up like simple salt flotation or formalin ether sedimentation. In heavy infection, the stool is frequently mucoid and charcoal laden crystals also seen. Treatment is drug of choice, such as mebendazole, the drug of choice. It is given 100 mg twice daily for 3 consecutive days. Trichuris. Now we will move on to the next uh, topic, strong oil oils. Exactly. The adult worm looks like a buggy whip. Anterior 3 fifths such as slender and the posterior 2 fifths is thick. Pinkish gray in color. The female worm is 3 to 5 cm in length, has a long slender esophageal region. Male hooks is smaller than the female and has a curved tail. The reproductive organs of a male and female are always double. A rakum dek to her trichuris. Okay, sir? That anterior is thick, like whip like, posterior is whip like the handle and motor. Ekta, barrel or spindle shaped in shape, 50 to 120 micron in size. It is brownish and has translucent polar plug at both the ends. The contents of the egg is undeveloped cell. Life cycle infective stage is fertilized by embryonic egg, swallowed, passively swallowed by the mouth without intermediate and reserve host. Adults, eggs are in warm soil deposited. Infective eggs are containing rabbiti from larva, ingested by the man. The larva hatch out in the small intestine, invades the intestinal wall, return to the intestinal lumen. And adults develop in 3 to 10 days. Age Add eta kintu mukosto rakta hai or itro. Chaichuri says a life cycle kintu mukosto rakta hai. Mean moi? Bari. Otri? Siborna? Bari. Light in jetabuga. Jetabuga bolam. Light infection asymptomatic. Middle clinical manifestation is abdominal pain, anorexia, diarrhea, constipation. Heavy infection causes bloody diarrhea, emaciation, prolapse of the rectal prolapse may also occur. Ego, try to do Now, coming on to strong oil allergies. Strong oil allergies remove the tinte, strong oil allergies, soil burning, papillosis, or most important is strong oil allergies, sarcoralis. <coughs> Parasitic disease, mostly tropical and subtropical area in temperate climates. This affects 30 to 10 million annually. Had ekhane kintu dutto unique life cycle rahe. Actor se free life cycle, actor se parasitic life cycle. This caused by direct contact with contaminated soil. Children are highly affected due to bad sanitation. Stronger than the Staphylococcus is a two millimeter long intestinal worm. Ei dak. Ek ta chhobi ta. Rabbiti from larva of the stronger than the Staphylococcus. Parasitic males are absent. Life cycle is heterogenic. It shows a complex life cycle with an alteration between free living cycle in the soil and the parasitic soil in the humans. Life cycle is completed in a single host. Human is a principal host. Dog, cats, and other animals serve as the reservoir host. This life cycle is unique and potential for auto infection and multiplication within the infected host and parasitic cycle. Or it is a short note auto infection. Which is very unique feature of strongolitis tarcoralis only. 
Human kibhabe infection acquire korte. Human acquires infection mainly through the penetration of the skin and occasionally the buccal mucosa by the infective filiform larva. These larva localize in the small blood vessels and are carried by the circulation to the heart and then to the lungs. Then they leave the pulmonary capillaries and are swallowed back to the small intestine. So, the skin is through the blood vessels, the circulation is through the pulmonary capillaries, the pulmonary capillaries are gas, alveoli is very gas, swallowed back to the small intestine. They burrow deep into the intestinal mucosa and produce eggs in about 28 days and which gives rise to the non-infective rhabditiform larva. These larva migrate back to the lumen of the intestine from where they are transfer, transformed into the filiform larva and causes auto-infection and they are passed into the stool outside the host to initiate the free living cycle. When the stool is going to the stool, it is the free living cycle and when the human host is going to the rhabditiform larva, it is the infective form and transfer to the stool. Pathogenic cycle. Auto infection is a unique feature. This occurs in patients with suppressed cell mediated immunity. Are most of the uh, strongolitis sarcolitis infections in um, man are asymptomatic? In symptomatic cases, thin down is a symptom. Act as a cutaneous skin disease, pulmonary, which is lungs, which is the pulmonary, which is the GI abdomen, which is the the skin by the filiform larva can produce dermatitis, itching at the site of uh, penetration and larva curance. Pulmonary manifestations include a Loeffler-like syndrome with Loeffler-like syndrome with pneumonitis, bronchopneumonia, and a high-grade eosinophilia. And intestinal manifestations include what? Profuse watery and mucoid diarrhea. Hyperinfection syndrome and dissimilated syndrome are two severe forms of strongolysis. That occurs only in immunocompromised hosts. In disseminated strongolysis, the larvae are widely disseminated beyond the intestinal tract and also found in the extra intestinal organs like CNS, heart, and endocrine organs. Invasive, that tinted, tinted disease called skin penetration, and pulmonary during cycle remigration, intestinal tissue destruction, anemia. Constipation, cough, and diarrhea, eosinophilic pneumonitis during the larva migration to the lungs, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. Death, neurological and pulmonary complications, and shock. Diagnosis, tool culture, is an effective way. Treatment, what is the treatment? Sangal is treated with ivermectin, thiabendazole. So, trichuris, trichura, vipom is uh, causes infection by ingestion. And strongolitis sarcolitis causes infection by mainly by the skin penetration. But strongolitis sarcolitis can cause three types of infection like skin infection, pulmonary, and abdominal infection. Okay? class, we will cover total soil transmitted helminths and overall review. Okay? We will cover class. Vasculitis, which affects kidney. Renal artery? Hmm. Vasculitis. Is that a vasculitis? Name, just the name you have to know of the vasculitis. Inflammation of vessels, small vessels, medium vessels, P and K, C and K. No, no, no. This was there in the last semester, wasn't it? Veginas, have you heard of Veginas? Chug straws, have you heard of these? Polyarthritis nodosa. So these are vasculitis which affects the kidney. Okay, so I will not be dealing with that today. But you have to know. Now, usually questions are not asked much from this topic. So, I think the better part for you is that you listen to the class carefully and just read the topic once. So, if any small question or if any MCQ comes from this topic, you are able to answer. Usually wrong questions are not asked, but it, since it's included in the syllabus, it may be asked. So, it's better that you know the topic briefly at least so that you can write something.
okay the orders are namely two one is nephrosclerosis another is the two vascular disorders now first we come to nephrosclerosis mane the different is there there is sclerosis of hyalinosis of the media or the intima or the externa right so there will be ultimately what will be there the vessel lumen becomes narrow right the vessel lumen normally uh, normally the vessel lumen is like this but in case there is hyalinization or sclerosis the vessel lumen becomes narrow like this and all of this is thickened so there will be less blood flow to the kidney there is less blood flow now because of the less blood flow what will be there blood flow kome gelo ki hobe yes there will be ischemia right so ultimately this ischemia these are small micro infarcts right small infarcts now this leads to cortical scarring any kind of ischemia will ultimately lead to scarring so this scarring will be there now the cortex now will appear like grain leather there is grain leather appearance of the cortex okay apart from that there is sclerosis of the glomeruli in term, in ultimately there is sclerosis of the glomeruli tubular dropout atrophy of the tubules and apart from that there is interstitium in the kidney there is fibrosis in the interstitium these are all consequence of less blood flow it's kind of logical right there will be sclerosis of the glomeruli also the glomeruli are not getting blood properly it appears because of the scarring it appears like grain leather you know what is grain leather normal leather hai na grainy appearance at a texture thake that kind of texture and apart from that glomerular sclerosis interstitial fibrosis that there is the arterioles are hyalinized the arterioles are have small they are hyalinized now uh, this normally the clinical features of this now we come to the clinical features normally uh, you will not really get to understand if a patient only has renal arterial sclerosis normally it does not really lead to many clinical features it do, do, doesn't present normally but in some patients it does present who are those patients say the patient is also suffering from other systemic disorders like diabetes so this will present apart from that if the patient has another cause of hypertension and there is uncontrolled hypertension then also this will present okay uh, now this is but this kind this is a result of chronic hypertension do you know what is malignant hypertension malignant hypertension what is malignant hypertension when the systolic blood pressure more than 200 20 this is called malignant hypertension you will see these cases these cases will come to the hospital now what happens is in these cases the patient usually presents with palpitation headache okay but you will have to look for signs firstly blood pressure is raised secondly you have to look at their eyes 
there will be retinal small retinal hemorrhages because of malignant hypertension itself there will be small retinal hemorrhages apart from that very important papilledema okay there will be papilledema retinal hemorrhages neurological symptoms and headaches right now malignant hypertension does not use the produce this what it does you should know this what what is the consequence of malignant hypertension in small vessels you have learned this in the first semester types of necrosis necrosis of vessels ki bole necrosis of vessels ke ki bole fibrinoid necrosis right there will be fibrinoid over there you saw hyaluronization of the arterioles yeah there will be fibrinoid necrosis of the arterioles apart from the there will be multiple layers and onion skinning of the vessels ultimately there is narrowing of the vessels or the vessels are not uh, the blood is not flowing through the vessels right next we come to renal artery stenosis now in renal artery stenosis uh, it is important to identify renal artery stenosis why because it is curable artery is stenosed a vascular surgeon comes in removes the stenosed area there is normal blood flow and patient is completely cured it is curable in 70% of cases so you have to know you have to know the clinical features you have to identify so that the patient can get treatment right so renal artery stenosis can be and another more stenosis more the hypertension this so there is stenosis decreased blood flow this activates the jg apparatus ductal glomerular cells are activated what will it do ductal glomerular cells ki kore ki renin renin increased renin hypertension hoyeche pharma te hoye geche tao renin jano na increased renin now what does renin do Angiotensin two. There is vasoconstriction. There is. It is called a rash pathway. What does this stand for? Rash pathway. Has anyone seen a blank? Can anyone hear this? Rash pathway. Do you know? Tell me. Start by. aldosterone salt pathway so ultimately there is salt
normally renal artery stenosis is due to a thrombus plaque and there is decreased blood flow another cause there is something called fibromuscular to renal artery stenosis which is a less important cause fibromuscular dysplasia in that there is fibrosis and hyalinosis of the media or the adventitia or the intima usually in younger patients usually in females right how will you diagnose stenosis increased plasma levels of renin apart from that you give a drug which block section of the high this apart from that you have to do arteriography by which you can pinpoint the exact area of the stenosis that can be removed there is cure okay these are the causes next i will come to the thrombotic disorders first here yeah. see this is the grain leather i was talking about this is what every wallet or bag whatever shoes are made of this so uh, the cortex has a similar appearance grossly this is an autopsy finding of course the cortex has a similar appearance and there is this this is the blood vessel there is hyalinosis and narrowing of the lumen and this is patchy the effect is patchy not all vessels are hyalinized some vessels will be hyalinized and there is narrowing this is hyalinized and ultimately this gives rise to wedge infarcts right like myocardium there are wedge infarcts this is renal artery stenosis see there is stenosis of the renal vessel artery and by arteriography you can pinpoint it's unilateral here you can pinpoint the exact area of stenosis next thrombotic disorder h u s t t p you have studied h u s and t t p studied what is hus ttp thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura right now uh, have any of you read uh, toxin by robin cook the story book toxin robin cook one golper boy pora na porachona boy pora na kono boy pora na Robin Cook, have you heard of the author? He writes medical mysteries. It's interesting. So, anyway, so this book Toxin, which is based on H H U S. Now, what happened? And E. coli, who is it? Micro the E. coli, Shigella. So, E. coli is a variant, right? Which leads to H U S. What is its name? Yes. Now, it is in H U S. It can be of two types. or atypical or diarrhea typical it 
can be also associated with an epidemic of this kind of E. coli or usually it is sporadic. How is it transmitted? Uh, in that book, this was there is child eats ground meat, a rare hamburger. This child eats this rare, rare money uh, undercooked, right? So, the, she eats this rare hamburger. Ultimately, there are some prodromes like mild uh, flu like symptoms or mild diarrheal disease. That is okay. You will not get to know. But uh, then there are these consequences. There is hematuria and there is hypertension ultimately there is acute renal failure and the patient dies the patient goes into shock and dies this is what leads this is the pathogenesis of hus now this shiga like toxin it causes now this these endothelia Leukocyte adhesion molecules, right? Leukocyte adhesion molecules, then there is activation of TNA alpha. All vessels throughout the body are affected. Kidney has small vessels, it is more affected, right? Right, this factor A, what it does is it leaves C3 convertase. Now, if factor A is not there for some mutation or antibodies, factor A is not there. C3 converted is increased, complete alternative pathway, right? And then there is vascular injury. Okay. Apart from this, HUS can also arise because of other vascular disorders like SLE, malignant hypertension, APLA syndrome, and there is another peculiar disease. In postpartum period, there can be renal failure. What happens is nor the mother delivers the baby normally, but after that, suddenly the mother presents with hematuria and acute renal failure. Okay, these are the other causes. Now, TTP. Adam TS thirteen. Thirteen. Do you know what its job is, Adam TS thirteen? Heard of von Willebrand factor? Now, von Willebrand factor is normally normally present. This Adam TS thirteen gives it two smaller molecules. Now, this is present. The intimer get deposited in the small vessels, right? And there is platelet activation, platelet adhesion, platelet activation, thrombosis. And there is this consumption, this is called consumption coagulopathy. You have heard of consumption coagulopathy? The platelet is getting consumed, the platelet is getting utilized in the small vessel. 
so ultimately there is thrombocytopenia thrombocytopenia leads to purpura so the definition is there in the name itself Is 13, there can be or RMTS 13, both can lead to TTP. If there are autoantibodies, it is the patient presents suddenly and maybe once in a lifetime. But if it is genetic, multiple episodes of TTP will be there, right? So, the pathology Yeah, you can see what are these? These are small blood clots, these are thrombi, these are the this is the glomerulus, right? So, in the glomeruli, there are these small thrombi. Here also in H and D stain, you can see. <coughs> can you see this? There are arrows given here. What is this? This is fibrinoid necrosis of small vessels. So, there are thrombi in the glomeruli. So, this leads to scarring of the glomeruli. There is atrophy and fibrosis, the same thing basically. <clears throat> the glomeruli are expanded and there are multiple thrombi. Normally glomeruli is in this big, it's smaller and these thrombi will not be present. Ultimately, this leads to cortical necrosis. Cortical necrosis can be patchy or diffuse. Here it is diffuse. You can see this is all necrosed. The columns of Bellini are necrosed and the entire cortex from the outside, this is all necrosis, right? And this I told you, this is the onion skinning that is found. In the blood vessels, there is onion skinning. Okay. Um, what else? Yeah, PTP, there is a pen tag. Right, there is thrombocytopenia, neurological symptom, all the pentad of features you will diagnose TTP. Right now, TTP used to be 100 percent mortality. There was 100% mortality in TTP, but now there is plasma exchange, plasma therapy, plasma exchange, and it is 80% to 90% curable. Nowadays, people don't die. If it is diagnosed at the right time, normally people don't die out of TTP. And for HUS, early institution of dialysis. You have to diagnose it properly so that there is early institution of dialysis that leads to cure. However, there are there, there is continuing scarring because the kidney is affected ultimately. So there is continuing scarring, and many years later, the patient will or may present with renal failure. Clots are also known as the nematelmintids, and they are found and they ultimately infested humans from the different areas. For example, from the soil, Ascaris lumbicoides can be transmitted like this. Platyhelminthes can be divided into trematodes and cystodes. Trematodes are also known as the flukes. Example is the blood flukes like schistosomiasis, liver flukes that infest the liver. Example is clonarchy sinensis, lung flukes is paragonimiasis, intestinal flukes of the fasciola hepatica, fasciola cyst. Within the cystodes, it can be beef tapeworm, it is caused by the tinea saginata, pork tapeworm, it is caused by the tinea solium. Fish tapeworm caused by the diphyllobotrium latum and dwarf tapeworm caused by the hymenolepis nana. 
So the, you will read about these names. These are important. Of this, the this tapeworm infestation, flukes infestation are important. So you can see these are the pictures of like roundworm, hookworm, filariasis, pinworm, male and female, etc. So these are picture under microscope. This is tapeworm, whipworm, onchocerciasis, and fasciola hepatica. So what are the common health means? We can commonly uh, call this as roundworm, hookworm, tradeworm, etc. Roundworm is basically Ascaris lumbricoides, hookworm is Ankylostoma duodenali and Nicator americanus, tradeworm is Enterobius vermicollaris and Strongyloides tarcolaris, whipworm, Trichuris trichura and Pichinella spiralis, filaria, filaria is basically caused by Boucheria bancrofti and Brugia maloi. Tapeworms are caused by different types of the tinea species, tinea solium. Saginata and Hymenolepis nana. Hydatid disease. It is caused by Echinococcus. Echinococcus granularis and Echinococcus multilocularis. Guinea worm. This is now eradicated from the world. It is. It was caused by the Dracanculus medinensis. So now coming to the anti-helminthic drugs. So those drugs that are active against this helmin. May, this may be again classified into either vermicide or vermifuge. Vermicide means drugs that kills the worms. And vermifuge means that expels the intestinal uh, infestational helminths. Mostly these helminths are infested with the host like the humans and they are expelled out from different excretory system. This can be excreted by peristaltic movement of the intestine or cathartic and purgative action. So we can do some catharsis or purgation by means of different types of the drugs. Ideal anti-helminthics should be orally effective because it is easy to give and easy to give for mass eradication of the helminthic infection. You know the helminthic infection quite common in some in schools or in teenage age groups or in hostels etc. Where we need some mass treatment. So for this we need some oral medication. Effective in single dose because it, again it is easier to give. Inexpensive and wide safety of margin with highest toxicity to worms and lesser toxicity to host. So it should be safe to the humans. So these are the available drugs of this the most important is the bench imidazole group. Within the bench imidazole groups the three most important is the mebendazole, albendazole and thiabendazole. Apart from this there are other anti-elmintic drugs examples are pyrantel, palmoid, piperazine, levamazole and tetramazole, diethyl, carbamazine, citrate, ivermectin, niclosamide, praziquantel and metriphonate. So these are the different names of the drugs that are active against the helminths. So first coming to the mebendazole. Mebendazole is the prototype anti-helminthic drug. It belongs to the nitroimidazole group. You can see this is the structure. This is slow in action, takes 2 to 3 days to develop. Site of action is microtubular protein beta tubulin and it inhibits the polymerization of the protein. Basically all this inhibits the protein synthesis, protein synthesis machinery in the worms. Intracellular microtubules are gradually lost. A range of other biochemical changes are also happening within the worms. For example, inhibition of the mitochondrial fumarate reductase. This mitochondrial fumarate reductase is important for respiratory chain in case of the worms. Without this, the worms cannot synthesize the ATP that is needed for its survival. Reduce glucose transport. Again, glucose is needed for its metabolism. Blocks glucose uptake in the parasite and depletion of the glycogen stored within the, within the worm. And uncoupling of the oxidative phosphorylation. So if it is uncoupled, again, the respiratory chain and ATP synthesis will be uncoupled and there will be no protein synthesis. So it is uh, of minimally absorbed, 75 to 90 percent is passed unabsorbed in the feces, excreted mainly in the urine. Adverse effect is very mild, some allergic reaction can happen. So it has 100 percent cure rates for roundworm, hookworm, enterobius and trichuris. 75 percent effective for tapeworms but it is not effective against the hymenolepis nana. Hydatid cyst, for hydatid cyst it needs a prolonged treatment. Hatching of the nematode egg and larva is inhibited and ascaris eggs are killed. It can be you, it can be, it is available basically as a chewable tablet, 100 milligram. Common indications for it, this roundworm, hookworm, etc., 100 milligram twice daily for three days. So it needs uh, three days and multiple dosing. 
Enterobius again 100 milligram single dose and in repeat after 2 to 3 weeks. Similarly, 200 milligram or 400 milligram twice daily and again it is to be given for 3 to 4 days. So now the congener comes and it is now most commonly used. This is the albendazole because it can be used in most of the cases the single dose and it is also available as a intravenous dosage form if there is infestation within the viscera or within the brain. So this is the congener of the mebendazole, comparable efficacy with mebendazole for roundworm, hookworm and enterobias. But it is less effective against trichuris, more effective against strongyloidis, tarcholidis. Trichinella effectiveness is same, more effective in tapeworm and hydratid larva and ova of ascaris and hookworm. It has very weak microfilarial action and cutaneous larva migraine. It is moderate and inconsistent oral absorption, fat meal enhances the absorption, that's why albendazole should be taken with food or after food and the food should contain some amount of the fat. Fraction is converted to sulfoxide metabolite which is the active form of the metabolite and it penetrates when we tee up after 8 to 9 hours. So this is the basis of tissue anti-helminthic action. So mebendazole usually do not have tissue action, mainly it acts within the intestinal system and it excretes the parasite but albendazole may act within the viscera if there is infestation of the worm occurs within the viscera. For example, it can penetrate the brain. So if there is some infestation within the brain, some ova or some larva that can be treated with albendazole. For intestinal worm given in empty stomach and for tissue actions with fatty melts. So those worms that mainly uh, infested only within the intestine it should be given in empty stomach but in most of the cases we are using albendazole when we want to eradicate both in the intestinal as well as if some forms of the ova is present within some viscera and that is the main form of the transmission so we have to give this mostly after food after some fatty food dosage usually it is available as 400 milligram tablet and syrup in most of the cases, when there is pinworm infestation that is quite common in school aged children, you know, uh, a single dose is usually given and it should be repeated after two weeks because the ova can mature after two weeks, the ova of this pinworm or roundworm. So single dose 400 milligram, tapeworm again, it is needed for some longer period, three days. Cutaneous larva migrants again 400 milligram for three days. You can see this is the neurocystic sarcosis, this is the cysticarcosis, this uh, larva and ova are present within the brain, it is transmitted within the brain and that leads to seizure and death can also happen. This is known as the neurocysticarcosis, here the intravenous dose of the albendazole is given 400 milligram twice daily for 1 to 2 weeks usually given. Again for hydratid disease, so hydratid cyst can develop again within the liver, within the lung, it can develop within the brain also. Here it is given for 4 weeks, you can see 400 mg breathing for 4 weeks, treatment of choice before and after, after some surgery. In most of the cases hydratid cyst is removed by surgery, but during surgery if the cyst is spilled over that can lead to widespread infection. That's why before surgery of the hydratid cyst we have to give some anti helminthic drug, most commonly the albendazole to, to most the kill the different types of the worms and then we have to do the surgery. For the filariasis with DC that is the diethyl carbamazine or evermectin in lymphatic filariasis and used in mass programs what I am talking. So most of the cases it is included within different types of the programs for eradication of worms and it is contraindicated in pregnancy. This, this is to remember it should not be given in pregnancy. Thiobendazole is another uh, benjamite. Basically, this was the first invented. Its clinical value has declined because of different types of the toxicity. Triclapendazole. It is specifically used for the treatment of the liver flukes. You, or you have already uh, seen that the flukes are the trematodes. So, these are the trematode infection. Most commonly that infect the liver. Basically, fasciolasis. Fasciolasis is caused by the fasciola hepatica and paragonimiasis. So, this affects the liver. We can treat this by triclabendazole. Single oral dose of 10 milligram per kg is effective, no significant side effect. Previously, another agent bithionol is used for fasciolopa hepatica in infection, but it is not used now because it has side effect of the photosensitivity. 
pyrental palm oil. Pyrental palm oil is another drug originally used for tradeworm, but it is now extended to hookworm and roundworm, less active against nicotar, strongyloides and trichodes. Mechanism of action, they activate the nicotinic cholinergic receptors and causes persistent depolarization. So when the persistent depolarization of the worms occurs, that leads to contracture and spastic paralysis and that ultimately leads to expel of the worms. So the worms ultimately by means of the hook like action, they infested the intestine and these are expelled by spastic paralysis and contracture of these worms. Piperazin causes flaccid paralysis and which have antagonizing action. This is a separate drug. So adverse drug reaction more commonly very less and these are not, not so important. So remember parental palmoid basically acts by activating of the nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Piperazin is just opposite of this parental palmoid. This parental palmoid causes spastic paralysis and piperazin causes flaccid paralysis. Flaccid paralysis, hyperpolarization of the ascaris muscles, decreased responsiveness, purgation often required and does not excite. So again, it is highly active against the ascaris and interibrias, but second choice drug. The first choice drug is of course the different types of the bendazoles, albendazoles, then the piperazin can be used. It is less or not active against hookworm. That is, it is active only against the roundworm, that is the ascaris lumbicoides and enterobias vermicularis. Libamizal and tetramizal, they are effective against any nematodes but restricted to ascariasis and ankylosomiasis. Ankylostoma duodenali is another agent. Mechanism, they again causes tonic paralysis of worms and expulsion of the live worms by stimulating ganglia. These ganglia are present within the worms, they stimulate this, that causes a tonic paralysis and the worms are excreted. Inhibition of the fumarate reductions of course occurs. In many of the cases, they decouple the oxidative uh, cycle with the respiratory chain. Dose the similar, usually the single dose is given. The name is levamizal and tetramizal. Diethyl carbamazine citrate. Again, this is important after the almendazole. Albendazole is the most important drug. Next important drug is the diethyl carbamazine citrate because it is used specifically for the filariasis. Filariasis, loasis, and tropical eosinophilia. It has been seen that in some of the cases, the eosinophil count continues to rise and becomes rise for months or years and that may happen due to some filaria larva. This is known as the tropical eosinophilia. This is a synthetic piperazine derivative rapidly absorbed from the gut, half-life of 2 to 3 hours which increases in alkaline urine, excreted in urine unchanged and dose is reduced in urinary alkalosis and renal impairment. Mechanism of action, they mainly alters the microfilarial membrane. Microfilarial is the agent that causes the filariasis. They alter the membrane and ultimately that is readily phagocytosed by the tissue monocytes. Since it is a piperazine derivative, they also causes the hyperpolarization and muscular weakness of the worms and again they are expelled. So diethyl carbamazine citrate, they are used in 50 mg, 100 mg tablet and suspension is also available. For the filariasis, the dose is 2 mg per kg thrice daily for 7 days. Usually the dose it is like this it is given. Intermittent microfilaremia is a problem. So 100 mg per kg for 3 weeks is given. That is prolonged treatment is given because some of the patients have repeatedly they are infested with the microfilaria. So prolonged treatment with different schedules has been found to achieve radical care in most patients. Elephantiasis is not effective. So when you will read the filariasis, you will see that there may be blockage of the lymph nodes and lymphatics. That may lead to swelling, very large swelling of the legs. This is known as the elephantiasis. This uh, diethyl carbamazine citrate kills the filarias, but they are directly do not have any effect on the elephantiasis. That is this elephantiasis, if it has been developed due to blockage of the lymph lymphatics, ultimately that cannot be treated by diethyl carbamazine citrate. Most of the cases, it, it, it ultimately remains for the lifelong. But if the filaria are killed, that will not progress. Tropical eosinophilia for it is 2 to 4 mg per kg thrice daily for 2 to 3 weeks is given. So long, long duration treatment is often needed with diethyl carbamazine citrate for filariasis. Adverse effects are again very less, some nausea, vomiting, etc. etc. We can start with the low dose and we can build up the dose. 
Ivermectin is obtained from the Streptomyces avermetilis. It is a, again the drug of choice for oncosarcosis and strongyloidosis and equal to dietary carbamazine citrate in filaria. Now this Ivermectin is often used for the treatment of the filariasis. Also effective in cutaneous larva migraines and ascariasis or like scabies and head lice. So you will see that the scabies infection, head lice infection that leads to different types of the dermatological conditions. It can also be treated with the Ivermectin. Ivermectin is a oral drug. It acts by special type of glutamate gated chloride channel found only in invertebrates. That is only in these worms, this glutamate gated chloride channel are present. They act via this. This is absent in men, but it is also absent in the flukes and tapeworms. That's why for the flukes, that is the trematodes and the tapeworms, we cannot use the Ivermectin. Ivermectin is only used for the filariasis, oncosarcosis, and strongyloidosis. Potentiation of the GABA activity and ultimately the warm muscles are again paralyzed and they are expelled out. They are absorbed well, half-life half -life is very long for Ivermectin, 48 to 60 hours. It is available as 3 to 6 milligram tablet for filaria, single dose 0.2 milligram per kg with 400 milligram albendazole annually for 5 to 6 years. Strongyloidase 0.2 mg per kg single dose. It is replaced dietyl carbamazine citrate in Oncosaca bulbulus by WHO. Again, the adverse drug reactions are very less. If you can remember that during COVID time, different drugs are tried to treat the COVID, COVID-19. Perhaps some of you have already consumed or your family members have also come to This Ivermectin has also come affront during the COVID times and in some of the guidelines, Ivermectin is also given. Can you remember anyone? So this Ivermectin is given in COVID-19. In many guidelines, it has been given, but ultimately later it has been seen that Ivermectin is not effective in case of the COVID-19. But many patients have taken this Ivermectin during the COVID-19 times. <coughs> Another drug is the Niclosamide. Niclosamide is highly effective against the cystodes. So different types of the cystodes can be affected by the Niclosamide. Cystodes means different types of the tinea. So either it is tinea solium or tinea sarginata or diphylobotrium latum or hymenolepis nana. Mechanism of action, again, either these two types of the mechanism, all of these acts. So uh, inhibition of the oxidative phosphorylation, so ATP will not be generated. And again, there is uh, either flaccid or spastic paralysis, tonic paralysis of the muscles and the worms are excreted. But the problem of the tinea solium is digestion of the dead segments can be hazardous because the ova which are released from this tinea solium may develop into larva in the intestine, penetrates its wall and dangerous visceral cysticarcosis can happen. So visceral cysticarcosis that may lead to neurocysticarcosis also. This can happen with the tinea solium. So that is the problem. So even if we are giving within this cyst, there are different types of the ova of the tinea solium that can spill over in the blood that can go into the brain also can develop neurocysticarcosis. That can go into the liver or lungs also the, and also develop different types of the visceral cysticarcosis. When you will read in your Helminthia cyst, you will also read about this. So the regimen available as 0.5 gram tablets of niclosamide, 2 gram stat, repeat after 1 hour and we have to give the saline purgation so that the there will be purgation, purgation so that the worms will be excreted uh, aflas with the stool. 2 gram daily for 5 days in hymenolepis nana infection. Usually the adverse reactions are very less. Praziquantel is another novel anti helminthic It mainly acts on the schistosomiasis and other trematodes. So niclosamide, remember, they act on the cystodes and praziquantel acts on the trematodes and cystodes but not any nematodes. Okay. So they are rapidly taken up by the worms. Again, they cause paralysis. The different types of the paralysis occurs. Similar type, detox is not required and they are also rapidly absorbed. So praziquantel mainly acts against the schistosomiasis and other trematodes and some cases of the cystodes but not any nematodes. The same thing, metriphonate. Metriphonate is basically an organophosphorus drug. You have read organophosphorus in your, uh, in your, uh, uh, in the anticholinergics. In the, so this is another organophosphorus compound which is used first as an insecticide and later as an anti -elmintic. So it has been seen that they have some anti helminthic action used especially for treatment of the schistosoma hematomium. It is a product and ultimately they converted to an active duct which is a dichlor host which is a potent polynesterase inhibitor, the similar type of organophosphorus. 
but it mainly acts on the worms and they have very very uh, minimal effect on the host cells that's why it is not uh, toxic to human so anti elementary treatment of the neurocystic sarcosis what i am talking so this is a dangerous condition that can also lead to death one of the two anti elementic are effective in killing cystic sarcosis albendazol is now preferred over praziquantel already we have seen the praziquantel is another drug that can be effective against this but albendazol is of course preferred because the course of treatment is shorter only 8 to 15 days is required while for praziquantel approximately 1 month is required cure rates is also more resolution of symptoms and disappearance of the cyst will be more corticosteroids enhance the absorption of the albendazol but lower the blood levels of the praziquantel it is often used corticosteroid is often used for the treatment of the neurocystic sarcosis okay and albendazol is cheaper whichever anti elementic is used this corticosteroid most commonly prednisolone or dexamethasone is used that is must be started 2 days before and continued till 2 weeks after completing the anti elementic course because it is necessary to suppress the anti inflammatory reactions to the products of the kill larvae the problem of different types of the cyst killing so may it be hydatid cyst may it be new cystic sarcosis all these cases if we are uh, doing some surgery or if we are killing the cyst there are content of the different ova or the toxic materials present within cyst that can spill over to the blood and that may leads to different types of the inflammatory reactions that's why we have to start the corticosteroid treatment approximately few days before and it will be continued continued till two weeks after completing the anti elementic course so this is the standard treatment for the neurocystic sarcosis so remember neurocystic sarcosis is caused by the tinea solium this tinea solium infestation can go to the different viscera that leads to visceral uh, uh, visceral infections the most dangerous of this is the neurocystic sarcosis and it can be treated by the two drugs one is the albendazole and that is the praziquantel of this the albendazole is preferred these are the reasons that's why the albendazole is preferred and both corticosteroids and albendazole is required for its treatment and why the corticosteroid is used before using of the albendazole because when we are killing there will be spill over of the inflammatory contents that leads to widespread septicemia widespread infection or inflammation that can be tackled by the corticosteroids so now coming to the drug of choice albendazole is the drug of choice remember of all nematodes except enterobius vermicularis for the enterobius vermicularis mebendazole is the drug of choice vaucheria bancrofti and bugia mallowi so this causes the filariasis so usually until now the drug of choice is the dietyl carbamazine citrate apart from this ivermectin is also used for the onchocerciasis and strongyloides ivermectin is the drug of choice and for the dracanculus medinensis metronidazole is the drug of choice we will come to the metronidazole so for the all the nematode infection nematode means may it be hookworm may it be roundworm may it be pinworm in all these cases we have to use the albendazole this is the drug of choice except few cases like enterobius mebendazole if there is filaria there is dc dietyl carbamazine citrate if there is oncocerca strongyloides ivermectin and for dracanculus medinensis metronidazole so this is important again for the remembrance you can see the praziquantel is the drug of choice of all trematodes and cystodes except the fasciola hepatica already you have seen the triclopendazole is another bendazole that is drug of choice for the fasciola hepatica okay that causes the liver fluke and albendazole again is the drug of choice for the hydatid cyst hydatid disease hydatid disease is caused by the hydatid cyst it is caused by the echinococcus granulosus okay so remember praziquantel is the drug of choice for all trematodes and cystodes except fasciola hepatica and hydatid disease okay in this anti elementic drug the most important you have to read about the albendazole okay albendazole next the praziquantel treatment of the neurocystic sarcosis and the treatment of the filariasis that is the dec even mecti so the last part the anti amebic and anti protozoal drugs until now we have completed the anti helminthic drugs now coming to the anti amebic and anti protozoal within the anti protozoal drugs already uh, the malaria part has been covered you know so now coming to the anti amebic drugs so amebiasis amebiasis is a problem in our country and many of the countries because of our poor sanitation because of the uh, environmental conditions low socio economic conditions etc and approximately many persons 
uh, you can you cannot believe that died due to the amoebiasis. So this is again a very common problem in our country. Uh, at least 40,000 deaths are attributable to amoebiasis and rank third among parasitic causes of the death behind only malaria and schistosomiasis in the whole of the world. So this is the trophozoite and the cyst of the amoeba. The most common amoeba that causes the amoebiasis is the entamoeba histolytica. Again in the microbiology or parasitology we will read about this. So this is the structure of the trophozoite and this is the structure of the cyst of the entamoeba histolytica. So how it causes the pathogenesis? It is a water borne pathogen. Again it is transmitted by the fecal oral route and due to the poor sanitation, poor environmental conditions, it transmitted from one person to another person. Again in the school or in the hostels, most commonly it is transmitted from one person to another person. This entamoeba histolytica exists in two forms. One is the cyst form, another is the trophozoid form. Cyst form is the dormant form which can survive outside the body. And the trophozoid form is a dividing form which is the non-infective and do not persist outside the body but they invasive. Invasive means they invade the organs and they, they can co-host with the, with the different types of the organs within our body. So there are two stages of the development. If we are ingesting cyst due to the contaminated water or contaminated food or something like that, it reaches the colon and it transforms to trophozoids from the, from the cyst. Then, then this cyst can either live as commensals without much problems but it will transmit the disease to other persons. From cyst that passed on to the stool, again it is transmitted by the fecal route to other persons and from amoebic ulcers which causes the acute dysentery, chronic amoebic dysentery which causes the vague symptoms and amoeboma that is again the cyst type formation can occur. And this can also occur in different types of the organs also. So all these, all these three can happen when there is fecal oral transmission of the ingested cyst. The cyst of the intermeva histolytica is ingested within our body. So fecal oral root again we can see this is the cyst and this is the trophozoid. So exo excistation, so cyst by means of the first in feces, it is resistant and it is infective. And within the body it is converted to trophozoid. And it it is it is it causes the replication and more and more uh, trophozoites are formed. It is mobile and it can invade the organs. <coughs> so trophozoites can enter the bloodstream and travel to other parts. What I am talking. So they can commonly they can go to the liver. Sometimes they can be infested to brain or lungs also and can cause different types of the liver abscess. The most common is the amoebic liver abscess. Very common. Amoebic liver abscess can happen if the amoebiasis is not treated. Okay. So in tissues only trophozoites are present, remember. So trophozoites is the invading form which is present within our body but the transmitted form from one person to another person by the fecal oral route is the different types of the cyst. Okay. So you can see the different organs can be affected. So what are the drugs? The drugs can be divided into tissue amoebicides and luminal amoebicides within the tissue and within the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. Intestinal and extraintestinal, for example, the most common of this is the nitroimidazoles. Within the nitroimidazoles, the most common drug is the metronidazole. And remember this metronidazole is not only an uh, antiprotozoal drug, this is also very active against the anaerobic bacteria. So against the anaerobes, anaerobic bacterial infections, the main drug is also the metronidazole. And this metronidazole also acts as an anti-amoebic drug or anti-protozoal drug. So different types of the nidazoles or nitronimidazoles are tinidazole, secnidazole, onidazole, satranidazole, etc. There are alkaloids like emetine and dihydroemetine. And for the extra intestinal killing of this amoeba, chloroquine is also effective. So this chloroquine is basically an anti-malarial drug that is also effective as an extra intestinal anti-amoebic drug. Within the luminal amoebicide that, that is that cannot kill the amoeba within the tissues that can kill only within the gastrointestinal lumen. Example is the diloxanide fluoride, nitazoxanide, quinodochlor, dihydroxoquinine and some antibiotics like tetracycline and paramomycin. So these are the drugs that are active against the amoeba. <coughs> so metronidazole very important, it is a prototype drug. It is discovered for the treatment of the trichomoniasis in 1959 
it has one broad spectrum side activity against the different types of the protozoa like entamoeba histolytica trichomonas vaginalis and giardia lamblia and i have already told that it is also the mainstay of the drug for different types of the anaerobic infection for example bacterial stagylis clostridium perfringens fusobacterium helicobacter pylori that causes the peptic ulcer clostridium difficile campylobacter jejuni and different types of the anaerobic streptococci apart from this this is also active against the dracunculus meningensis or helminths already we have seen for the dracunculus meningensis the drug of choice is the metronidazole till now no resistance has been shown so metronidazole active against this this is important mechanism of action so basically this anaerobic bacteria of the helminths usually used a respiratory chain this is a unique to anaerobe this is known as the pyruvate feridoxine oxidoreductase pathway or pfor pyruvate feridoxine oxidoreductase pathway by this respiratory chain atp synthesis happens and this atp is required for the bacteria to survive so metronidazole firstly when it is given it is diffuses within both the aerobic and anaerobic bacteria but mostly it has bactericidal activity against the anaerobic bacteria and the different types of the protozoa it is reduced to nitro radicals and these nitro radicals have some redox potential and they acts as a electron sink that is they accept the electron just like that of uh, that of the agents present in the respiratory chain so nitro radicals acts as an electron sink they competes with the biological acceptor sites of the anaerobic organism for the electrons generated by this pyruvate feridoxine oxidoreductase pathway for the pyruvate reduction so when it competes this metronidazole ultimately accept the electron so the respiratory chain is uncoupled the respiratory chain continues but there will be no atp production on the other hand they also generate different types of the cytotoxic particles most commonly different nitro radicals that also interact with the different dna and this dna becomes destabilized and they become destroyed cytotoxic intermediate particles interact with this host cell dna resulting dna strand breakage and fatal destabilization of the dna helix so both ways so mechanism of action of the metronidazole is in the one hand it destabilizes the dna dna and ultimately protein synthesis machinery becomes stopped on the other hand it acts as an electron sink the nitro radicals of the metronidazole it accept the electron it competes with the normal metabolite present within the electron transport chain or respiratory chain so it decouples it so the atp synthesis again hamper so on the one side the dna is destabilized dna is destroyed on the other hand the atp is not synthesized so ultimately the anaerobic bacteria or the protozoa are destroyed so this is the mechanism of action of the metronidazole so for, again it is well absorbed from the small intestine widely distributed in the body secretions like vaginal secretion semen saliva and csf that's why if there is uh, we, uh, so if there is vaginitis or prostatitis in all these cases metronidazole can be used metabolized in liver by oxidation and glucuronidation and half life is 8 hours that's why the doses of the metronidazole is usually three times of the daily so in many of the cases you will see that it is given twice daily but it will not be effective most common adverse effects some metallic taste in the mouth nausea vomiting abdominal cramp can occur and for prolonged administration peripheral neuropathy and cns effects occur and seizures can happen at high dose many of you have already consumed the metronidazole for some diarrhea or dysentery you know about this metallic taste is already present so contraindication first trimester of pregnancy so metronidazole is widely used in many of this uh, anaerobic infections or or, <coughs> or different types of the protozoas but remember it should not be given in pregnancy neurological disease and blood dyskinesia can happen and chronic alcoholism because if the metronidazole is given with alcohol ultimately the aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme can be uh, can be affected and disulfiram like reaction can happen so that leads to chilling that leads to dizziness vomiting flushing burning sensation throbbing headache visual disturbance etc so usually when metronidazole is given the patient is asked to abstain from the alcohol at least for the uh, one week so disulfiram irreversibly inhibits the oxidation of acetaldehyde by competing with the nad for binding sites of the aldehyde dehydrogenase 
So this NAD is affected and disulfilum ribe reactions happen. So remember metronidazole and alcohol interactions, disulfilum ribe reactions can happen. That's why the patient is asked to abstain from alcohol intake. It is used amoebiasis, first line of the drug. It kills the entamoeba histolytica prophogoids, but it it lesser kills the cyst. So prophogoids are mostly killed, cysts are less killed. Treatment of all tissue infections of entamoeba histolytica, mild intestinal invasive liver abscess. So all types of the amoebiasis, be it, be it invasive or non-invasive, we have to use the metronidazole. Less effect happens the luminal parasites. So it must be used with a luminal ambicide. So if it is present only in the intestine, we have to add some luminal ambicide. Apart from this GRDSs, trichomonas vaginitis, uh, it is the drug of choice. Anaerobic bacterial infections, pseudomembranous chloritis that is caused by the Clostridium BPCD, ulcerative gingivitis, trench mouth in all these cases, helicobacter pylori infections that causes peptic ulcer, all these cases metronidazole is used. Apart from this, there are other nitroimidazoles like timidazole, secnidazole, ornidazole, saturnidazole. You will see that now mostly you will uh, have some combinations of the ciprofloxacin or ofloxacin with some timidazole or ornidazole. Okay. So these are more or less similar. There are some changes in the pharmacokinetics, otherwise, these are more or less similar. These are the alkaloids, emetin and dihydroemetin. They are obtained from the cephalis, and the dihydroemetin is a synthetic analogs, they kill the trophozoids of the entamoeba histolytica, uh, they inhibit the intraribosomal translocation of the tRNA amino acid complex, they have actions on the trophozoids but again not on the cyst, administered by subcutaneous or intramuscular, oral preparations are absorbed periodically. that's why it is lesser used nowadays, reserve drug for severe intestinal or extraintestinal amoebiasis for patients not responding to metronidazole. So remember, emetin and dihydroemetin is used mainly systematically because the oral absorption is erratic and it is reserved for resistant amoebiasis infection. Chloroquine, you know, it is an antimalarial drug that also kills the trophozoids of the entamoeba histolytica. Concentrates in liver and used in hepatic amoebiasis. It is used. So for hepatic amoebiasis, chloroquine is used completely absorbed from the upper intestine. Efficacy in ambic liver abscess is equal to emetin, but longer treatment needed and relapse may occur used after a course of metronidazole and luminal ambicide must be added. So when there is infestation of the amoeba within the liver or any of the organ, we have to use the all of these agents. We have to start with the metronidazole, which is the mainstay of the drug, and we have to add some other luminal ambicide and chloroquine. Diloxanide fluoride is the most commonly used luminal amoebicide. Diloxanide fluoride. It is a highly effective luminal amoebicide. That is the amoeba that is present only within the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. Kills tropogyes responsible for production of the cyst. However, no antibacterial actions. So nitroimidazoles or imidazoles have also have antibacterial actions, but they have only this anti-protozoal action. So when this diloxanide fluoride is given, this is uh, divided into fluoride and diloxanide. Fluoride is hydrolyzed and it exerts effect and this diloxanide is split, 90% is absorbed and remaining 10% reaches large intestine and also exerts effect. So that is both of this part exert effect in two ways. No systemic antibiotic activity is evident with diloxanide despite its absorption. So diloxanide part is absorbed but it is, it is used only as luminal amoebicide. If the amoebic infection is present within some organs, within some viscera, it cannot be treated by only luminal amoebicide. Used in mild tissue amoebiasis, amoebiasis or asymptomatic cyst passage, tissue amoebiasis, liver abscess with metronidazole. Usually it is used in combination with the metronidazole or metronidazole plus chloroquine, etc. It is also well tolerated. Nitazoxanide is another broad spectrum antiparasitic agent. Uh, it is mainly used in the GRDSs and diarrhea caused by the cryptosporidia. Mechanism of action is similar to the metronidazole. Eight hydroxoquinolines. Previously, it was very commonly used for the uh, diarrhea or dysentery. So the drugs are the iodoquinol, siloquinol, quinodochlor, and iodochlorohydroxyquine. So they are active against the entamoeba, giardia, trichomonas, and against some fungi and bacteria also. They have again the, some luminal ambicidal action, but no tissue action. 
they are not effective in acute dysentery but in chronic intestinal amoebiasis. So, when there is chronic intestinal amoebiasis, we can use the 8 hydroxyquinoline derivative. They are absorbed very less amount and previously uh, these are the very common drugs but it has been seen that if it is given for the long period of the time, a typical adverse effect known as the subacute myelooptic neuropathy can develop. Suboptic myelooptic neuropathy. This is an inflammation of the optic nerve causing a complete or partial loss of vision and also peripheral neuropathy occurred by prolonged or repeated dose of the relatively high doses of the quinodoclor and it was seen mainly in the Japan. These are used alternative to uh, diloxanide in amoebiasis, GRTA, local treatment of the vaginal trichomonas, jungle and the bacterial infections. You have probably heard of the brand name the enteroquinol. Previously enteroquinol or these types of the 8 hydroxyquinolones were uh, indiscriminately used but with the uh, advent of the new one drugs it is very less used and even if it is used it should be given for the minimum amount of the time because if it is given for the larger amount of the time for the uh, for the large doses that leads to suboptic myeloptic neuropathy. This is important why it is less used. Tetracyclines is the antibiotic this is also used mainly it is used uh, for the enteroviva infections because the uh, they have inhibitory action on the entamoeba. Details is not required. Choices of the drug, the same thing, the different types of the imidazoles. Now coming to the trichomonas vaginitis infections, metronidazole or tinidazole is usually given and if in all of these cases, it should be repeated after one and a half months. Additional intravaginal treatment for refractory cases is given. Both partners should be treated and local application of the quinodoclor Clotrimazole, natamycin, povidonidine, etc. given. So, trichomonas vaginitis is sexually transmitted. So, both partners should be treated. Now, another important thing is the drugs for the leishmaniasis. So, Kalajar. Kalajar is uh, very frequent in our country, in Brazil and in some of the East Africa. So, Kalajar can be divided mainly, uh, we, ca we can divide this as visceral so, leishmania, so Kalajar is caused by the leishmania donovani san, uh, parasite, a uh, protozoa. So, this leishmania donovani causes leishmania. Leishmania can be mainly divided into three parts. One is the visceral leishmania. This visceral leishmania is also known as the Kalajar. Apart from visceral leishmania, there may be cutaneous leishmania, which is the most common leishmania worldwide. This is also found in United States also. And another is the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. It is also present in different uh, areas of the Africa and India also. So, visceral leishmaniasis, also known as the Kalajar, cutaneous leishmaniasis and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. All these can be treated by similar types of the drug. So, visceral leishmaniasis, also known as the Kalajar, it is caused by the leishmania donovani. It is transmitted by a female sandfly, phlebotomas. Phlebotomas is a sandfly that transmit is Many parts of the Bihar, Jharkhand and some parts of the West Bengal have uh, till now it is witnessing the Kalajar. Uh, our government have uh, given the target of the eradication of the Kalajar by 2020 but it has, has not happened till yet. Kalajar is primarily a disease of the economically poor class, so low socioeconomic condition cases. India launched a Kalajar control program and what are the available drugs that is used for the treatment of the Kalajar? Very important. So, antimonial compound, so antimony is present, sodium stevogluconate, apart from this some antifungal agents are also effective like amphotericin B, now it is the mainstay of the treatment of the Kalajar and ketoconazol and there are some oral drugs like miltepocin and some other drugs like paramomycin. So, these are the drugs effective against the leishmania donovani. Pentamidin was previously used but not used now, ketoconazol and allopurinol have weak anti-leishmania action but are not used now. So, allopurinol, if you can remember, this is an anti-uric acid agent, so uricosuric agent. So, when the uric acid is high, hyperuricemia, we have to use the allopurinol and it has some weak anti uh, uh, anti-leishmania action also. So, now coming to the sodium stevogluconate, this, uh, this was previously the drug of the choice, but now resistance have developed, that's why it is lesser used nowadays. It is a water-soluble pentavalent antimonial compound one third antimony is present by weight. Mechanism of action is they the relatively non-toxic pentavalent antimonial act as prodrugs. 
so that are reduced to more toxic this this is the antimony sb sb plus species so antimonial compounds that is transmitted uh, that is converted to antimony plus sb plus species that kills the amastigotes so when we will read about the uh, lismania you will see there are two forms amastigot form and promastigot form and they kill the amastigot form within the phagolysosomes of the macrophages within our macrophages phagolysosome this amastigot form is present they this antimonial form that toxic form ultimately kills the am anti amastigot this antimony also induces a rapid efflux of the triphenethroan and butathrian from the cells and also inhibits the triphenethroan reductase thus causing a significant loss of the thyroid reduction potential in the cells so this reduction potential again is a needed for the electron transport chain and when it is uh, it, it is abolished that leads to oxidative damage so all these damage are caused by the antimonial compound and antimony the free antimony is the toxic compound that leads to this anti lismanial action this is not metabolized excreted unchanged in urine after intramuscular injection the sodium stevoglucuronate is given by intramuscular injection dose is 20 to 30 mg per kg deep im daily in buttock for 20 to 30 days so this is a long term very painful treatment depends on response also it can be given iv in some of the cases should be given in alternate days in poor health patients so when there is less nutritional status all antimonials are toxic but pentavalent compounds this pentavalent antimonials are less toxic and better tolerated nausea vomiting metallic taste etc can happen and anaphylaxis that leads to shock and death can also happen that's why it is lesser used nowadays so the drug of the choice for the scalazar is now the amphotericin b this amphotericin b is basically an antifungal drug antifungal effective against the lismania two forms are available liposomal and deoxycholate form of this the liposomal form is less toxic that causes the target specific action on the lismania species but it is more costly like fungi lismania has high percentage of the ergosterol in their cell membrane and is susceptible to this antibiotic which has high affinity for ergosterol and acts by binding to it so they have cell membrane that contains the ergosterol this amphotericin b blocks the ergosterol so ultimately it is particularly suited for kalajar because it delivers the drug inside the reticular endothelial cells in spleen and liver where the amastigot lives so liposomal amphotericin b causes a target specific killing of this because this amphotericin b is very much toxic to kidney in our body so liposomal amphotericin b is lesser toxic now drugs with highest cure rate in kalajar 99% cure rate but the adverse drug reaction already have told that is the nephrotoxicity and this is now the first line drug by the who but it is quite costly the liposomal amphotericin b miltepocin is the latest drug which can be given orally it is the first orally effective anti lismania drug it is used in india uh, with the four weeks course that causes the greater than 95% cure rate but mechanism of action probably it interferes with lipid metabolism prevents synthesis of the cell surface molecules and alters signal transduction usually it is used in combination therapy with uh, liposomal amphotericin b or paramomycin because the effectivity of this miltepocin is lesser so uh, the same thing next thing is the paramomycin paramomycin is the aminoglycoside antibiotic so i have already you have uh, uh, you have uh, class on the aminoglycoside so this is another aminoglycoside paramomycin that is used for the treatment of the kalajar active against many protozoa not only the kalajar entamoeba giardia cryptosporidium some tapeworm trichomonas etc the mechanism of this anti protozoal action again same to that of the antibacterial action that is the mechanism of action of the aminoglycosides they they blocks the protein synthesis by acting on the 50s ribosomal subunit they are efficacious luminal amoebicide this is an alternative drug for the giardiasis especially during the first trimester of pregnancy when metronidazole and other drugs are contraindicated so this is very important so if you are asked that during pregnancy which drug should be given for the giardiasis or amoebiasis or any other protozoal infection you have to paramomycin so paramomycin is the only drug that can be given in pregnancy when some protozoal infection happens because it is it is not teratogenic in intestinal protozoal infection it is used by oral route and 
it is it is also approved for India in visceral leishmaniasis by intramuscular route. So there are some other drugs that is used in some other infections that is not always prevalent in India. For example, remember just the names, iflornitin is used in West African and Gambian trypanosomiasis that is caused by the trypanosoma brucei gambians, okay. So trypanosomiasis, very common infection in Western world but not here. West African trypanosomiasis can be treated by iflornitin, melazorphal, melazorphal is used for the treatment of the late or CNS stage of the East African trypanosomiasis. This East African trypanosomiasis is caused by the trypanosoma brucei rhodesians, okay. So this is caused by the trypanosoma brucei gambians. This is the West African trypanosomiasis, iflornitin and the East African trypanosomiasis is treated by the melazorphal. You will read about this in your microbiology also. So trypanosomiasis, nifutimox and benz nidazol. These are used for the treatment of the American trypanosomiasis. This is uh, caused by the trypanosoma cruzi. So nifutimox and benz nidazol. So these are used for the American trypanosomiasis. This can be used for different types of your MCQ, in, uh, MCQ questions later, okay. Pentamidine, pentamidine is a broad spectrum agent mainly used in the treatment of the early stage trypanosoma brucei gambians infection and alternative treatment for the pneumocystis carini pneumonia. Pneumocystis carini or pneumocystis zerobesi pneumonia if you can remember this is mostly frequent when the patient is immunosuppressed mainly in the HIV infection. So in those cases, we have to use different types of the agents. One of these agents is also pentamidine. So it can be used in pneumocystis carini or pneumocystis gyrobosis pneumonia. Suramine is another trypanocyte that is high clinical activity against both the trypanosoma gambians and rhodesians. Okay. So there is a typical uh, reaction occurs with this suramine. This is known as the majority reaction. Uh, because when it is used in onchocerciasis, onchocerca volvulus is another protozoa that can cause reverb blindness, okay, in the eye. So when it is given for the treatment of this onchocerca volvulus infection, there may be some pruritic rash, fever, malaise, lymph node swelling, eosinophilia, arthralgia, hypotension, permanent blindness all can occur due to again the spilling of the toxic components of the protozoa due to the sudden death of this protozoa. So this is known as the majority reaction, okay. This can occur with the tsunami. So this is all about the different types of the protozoa. So already I have said what are the important the anti things Within the protozoa, the most important is the metronidazole. This is a uh, very common, uh, 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 common question as a short note, metronidazole, it can also be used in the uh, can be asked in the viva, the mechanism of action and what are the indications of the metronidazole. Remember, it is the first line drug for the anaerobic infection, anaerobic bacteria as well as different types of the protozoa. After the metronidazole, the next important is the treatment of kalajar. What are the drugs that can be used for the treatment of kalajar? Sodium stevogluconate and different other drugs. What are the, uh, why the sodium stevogluconate is lesser used now? What are the newer drugs like miltaprosin, etc.? and then the other drugs can be asked. Long bone. What other long bones do you know? Arkon kon long bone hoy? Ar? Tibia, fibula, radius, ulna, clavicle, of long bone. So, or modde thike, this is the most important one because we can uh, find the stature from it. Stature length of the individual, best bone, best bone for finding stature is this one, long bone, this is femur, okay. So let's start. This is the anatomy as given, main things you have to know for particularly for forensic aspect is this head, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, shaft, medial epicondyle, and lateral epicondyle. First of all, you when you are presenting the bone, you have to present it in an anatomical, in anatomical position. So you will hold the bone like this in anatomy also, in forensic also. You have to hold it in your anatomical position. So this is the anterior aspect. 
and this is the posterior aspect so this most of you will may get con confused for while holding the bones you pass it on feel the contours for the morphology part whether it's more muscular markings are more prominent or not whether head is uh, larger or not is this heavy or not which is which are the which one is the medial epicondyle which is the lateral epicondyle all those things okay so in forensic exam that is you will be having practical and viva for practical purpose there will be many station like station 1 2 3 4 5 maybe 5 so in five sta uh, stations each station in exam you will be having 10 minutes to write it down and sit for viva okay so in for that purpose uh, you have to know what will come like one bone will come any bone it may be male bone or female bone femur or hip means pelvis what is this bone this is innominate bone because it has combination of three bones ilium pubis and yes so this you should know and then any of the bone will be coming as one sample one station another there will be x rays for age estimation that will be taught later another one will be poison identify the poison write the medical legal uh, importance of it then there would be another station for writing a um, what do you call medical legal certificate in injuries and all and another one may be there for uh, i guess weapon so like that five station would be there for your practical exams so this bone will be given in table this bone or maybe femur or pelvis anything it will be given in one table and it will here uh, the question format will be like this identify the bone and write the medical legal significance okay that would be the question so how will you answer it so first of all what is this so you will what will you say what is this you have given so what would be the, your answer you will not answer that just it is a femur see this it's a human femur dried and devoid of soft tissue this will be your scientific answer okay human femur dried and devoid of soft tissue there are no soft tissue present okay it's dried bone and there are so how do you know this is of a human bone so next question the examiner will be asking you that how do you know is it a human bone it could be wooden particle it could be anything it could be what you call uh, that plastic pvc molded one how do you know that it is bone so your answer will be how will you know any guess what how will you know how do you know this is a, a human bone so you have read anatomy right anatomy is over i guess so you will stay say that from my morphological and anatomical knowledge i can say that it is of a human origin okay human bone if in case a fragment of bone is given to you means the, the whole bone has not been given to you a small fragment a police uh, found something in the garbage suppose half of it and they have brought to you and saying that sir please identify it please tell us what it is and uh, give us some opinion regarding it so how will you do it so there are first of all is you will see by microscopy you will take a fragment of it see in the microscope see under the microscope how it appears whether there are osteons or there or not haversial canal system is there or not so that is this one microscopic examination but there is a fallacy in microscopic examination is that this uh, structure resembles the apes also apes means chimpanzee and all okay they will also be having similar structure now you will be of uh, there will be problem now how do we say that it is of a human 
so the next one is very important this is precipitant test Preci pre precipitant test uh, the examiner will be asking you anywhere means this test you should know what it is precipitant test is on a, like a immunological test only here what happens is we take that fragment from the bone small fragment in a test tube add some normal saline and shake it well and keep it for some time then we add anti human immunoglobulin to it okay anti human means so that we can uh, get a Im immunological response by forming a precipitin means precipitation reaction will take place if it is of human origin there will be precipitation reaction a white ring will form in the test tube in between indicating that it is of human origin that re precipitation reaction has been positive it is positive for human bone so that is precipitin test this is uh, compulsory you must know this in any bone they will be asking uh, what is precipitin test second question is like uh, how will you know means what is precipitin test and how will you uh, what is the application of precipitin test done microscopy done precipitin te test done chemical test means uh, like that if we burn the bone there will be bone ash bone ash can be subjected to chromatography okay that gas chromatography is there liquid chromatography is there means there is a there will be it's it's a type of spectrometer means in that ash they will be bombarding it with something and there will be a reading coming out whether it is whatever elements it's there in in, in it and according to it they can say that it is human and all so these three tests precipitin test microscopic test and chemical test other chemical test for identification whether calcium is there inside it or not so all those tests now coming another one is dna test that's also done can be done so this second part of the question is you have identified the bone that it is of uh, whatever it is dried um, uh, dried a uh, specimen of a human femur or anything and second part is derive the medico legal uh, opinions about it so what are the opinions can you derive from the bone so these are the uh, parameters we can derive for every bone it will be the same most of it but few bones we cannot de de determine the race few bones we cannot determine the uh, sex so those bones are separate but from this bone we can derive all these things okay so first we will start with race so by race uh, it can be uh, said by the morphological features morphological features means ota ke dekhe amra bujhbo je whether uh, means it width koto length koto mane mota whether it's uh, uh, long or not morphological features race can be said but we will, we are more interested in metric part metric part with measurement okay so measurement means amader ota ke measure kore bolte kore ota ke dekhte hobe je ki race e porche so that is mostly stature okay finding the stature morphological features bone length index index is the important one metric part so in index there are three crural index intermembranal index and humor of femoral index these three names you have to remember in this femur part uh, they will be asking you tell us tell me about the indexes so you will say this is crural intermembranal and humor of femoral now now i will explain what is crural what is intermembranal and what is humerofemoral so crural index is length of tibia by length of femur into 100 easy easy to remember so for indians it is 86.49 okay normal value what are the races do you know race मिक्स 
anybody asks uh, what race do we belong we say it's mixed race okay mixed means caucasians or negroid or caucasians with mongoloid we are that progeny mixed race pure aryans that is myth <laughs> okay the second index is intermembrane index humerus plus radius by femur plus tibia means uh, what is called upper limb by lower limb into 100 okay values you can take a picture or you can write it down it's up to you humerus femoral index humerus by femur into 100 hmm बोन शुड बी लेस दें फिफ्टीन इन ओल्ड मरे जा ওরা 15 বছর পর্যন্ত প্রেসিপিটিন টেস্ট করে জানা যেতে পারবে উইদ ইন 15 ইয়ার্স আফটার 15 ইয়ার্স হোয়াট উইল হ্যাপেন ইজ দি বোন ম্যাটেরিয়াল দি কম্পোজিশন ডিগ্রেডস দি প্লাজমা প্রোটিনস ডিগ্রেডস সো উই ক্যান নট গেট দি ইমিউনোলজিক্যাল রিঅ্যাকশন फ्रॉम দি বোন সো আপ টিল 15 ইয়ার্স নাও কামিং টু সেক্স সো দি বোন গিভেন টু ইউ you will see first the morphological features whether it is heavy or not muscular markings are more prominent or not theek hai male femur you will start writing like this if in case you have you get a bone that is male femur in exam you will say that it is massive heavy impression of muscular attachment sir well marked you will not you will not write first male femur okay you will start writing that one dried and devoid of soft tissue human fever then you start it is massive heavy uh, impression of muscular attachments are there if in case it is a female one then you will write this one uh, lighter and impressions of muscular attachments are less prominent you will start with this now we'll come to metric part metric parts means eta amra measure kore bolbo je eta male na female thik ache ota ast this you uh, take a picture or draw this is important one this parameters this is bicondylar width this is uh, this fifth one is program means oblique length trochanteric oblique length this is head of femur diameter this is neck with shaft diameter uh, angle neck of shaft and uh, this is this angle and this is popliteal length this is linea aspera where the linea aspera in the lower distal part divides into uh, what do you call lateral and medial lip so from here to the the above the intercondylar uh, line that is above the notch you can see there linea aspera you should know where is linea aspera this uh, prominent thing posterior aspect you will see that that line is there that is linea aspera so examiner will ask you uh, where show us show me linea aspera show me nutrient foramen okay where is the nutrient foramen how the blood supply enters it's always from below to upwards posterior okay posterior surface <coughs> photo niye chis kimba draw kore ne etar pore sob kichu asbe it is a osteometric board okay this is also a question what is this <coughs> this is osteometric board osteometric board ki eta ekta rectangular uh, box er moton <coughs> one end is fixed other end is moving so that we can measure the bone length of the bone so here is the measurement tape okay <coughs> or scale so while while we are while will be sliding this one the uh, we can measure it from here to there it will be like 1 2 3 4 5 6 so wherever it it touches down that is that would be the length of the bone 
<coughs> from this we can calculate the stature multiplication factor and we can calculate it i will come later so the name of the board is important hepburn osteometric board hepburn osteometric board another one is trevor t r e v o r trevor osteometric board hepburn is uh, okay it means best if they ask you whatever what type of osteometric bo board do you know you will say hepburn and trevor okay <coughs> okay now coming to the metric so ami jeta bolechilam je age je oi starting korli oi bhabe large massive jodi male hoy ar light and eta holo female diye tar pore metric part e likhbi he ki ki ache oi chota jinish whatever the uh, means uh, things i have shown you 1 2 3 4 5 6 these things you will be measuring and you will be writing these things okay head it will be larger in male forms more than 2/3 of a sphere boro hoy oi head ta thik ache and vertical diameter will be more than 47 mm oi oi head head er je ta eta Forty-seven millimeter. Or for females, it will be less. It will be forty-five, and in female, it will be smaller. Forms less than two-third of the sphere. Angle of the neck with shaft. The angle ta ache. It will be obtuse, one twenty-five degree. One twenty-five degree is important because most of the angles is one twenty-five degree in forensic, mostly. So, angle of neck with shaft is 125 degree obtuse. In female, it is less, less than 125. Popliteal angle, linear aspera theke intercondylar line. Popliteal length. Kato number? Three number to? Or ja niche three number? Linear aspera theke intercondylar. Oi intercondylar notch achhe tar upore ita. Oi line ita. Posterior aspect theke nita hai. Okay, that will be more in males, less in females. Th number three, number two, ta hoga lo angle more than 125 in males, less than 125 in females. Three hoga lo popliteal length. Four hotche ki bicondylar width. Bicondylar width. For males it will be more, females it will be less. You have to by heart this. On exam, okay. You can now take it down the numericals or you take a picture, whatever it is. While in exam, you have to buy it because then only you can uh, write all these things. <coughs> Trochanteric oblique length. Sorry, sorry. <coughs> a greater trochanter from here to the end. <coughs> <coughs> greater trochanter to the end distal end so it will be more than 450 in males and less than 390 in females angle angulation of shaft with condyles 80 degree where there is 75 degree so how will you do it uh, place the bone over your uh, what is called Uh, that straight way, not like this, straight vertically. Yes, you can see that's the angle formation is there. Flat surface, any book or something anywhere. See, there is angle laterally. See, this. Okay, you will you see laterally there is angle. <coughs> Angulation of shaft with condyles is 80 degrees, whereas there is 75 degrees. So it is in lateral aspect. Okay, laterally. Another thing is intercondylar notch. The notch is acute, means narrowed in male, whereas in female it is wider, U-shaped, U and V. Its male is more like V, and female it is more like U. Okay. 
pelvis is also same angle will be v shaped in male u shaped in female okay so males females how will you see you just uh, put it in bone like this and see okay so you from here also you can make it that this is male and this one is female this is the posterior aspect of male and female this is articulation of the joints for males and female so the hip bone in female while if you if you see the angle here this is more inclined outwards okay like this for whereas in males it is bit straight females it will be like this articulation now coming to the next part that is age estimation age estimation is ossification ossification means uh, uh, do you know how many oss ossification centers are there in femur uh, first of all there is primary ossification center and there are secondary ossification center so it has one primary ossification center that is in the diaphysis and it ossifies intrauterine in intrauterine life okay in the womb itself it ossifies primary now coming to the main thing that is secondary ossification centers secondary ossification center is there in the head greater trochanter lesser trochanter and distal femur so this also you have to by heart remember so that when in these bones uh, are the ossification center fused or not tell me fused right so you can say that the age will be more than by this chart what will you what can you say the age will be more than more than yes more than 17 years old correct till 19 years but it it is it can be you can say from it mostly up till 17 years more than 17 years <clears throat> i will tell you how to uh, say the opinion means how to form the opinion at, uh, for the age aspect suppose you get the value mm, in x ray part we will discuss that because don't we will not make it more complicated today you by heart this for now in x ray radiological plates will be given to you and then i will explain how to form opinion okay like just as he said the age will be more than 19 but 19 how enough because there is a lesser 19 is the maximum part but 16 to 19 for example if you take only this parameter 16 to 19 so in uh, when we say it is above then we will say above 16 years when it is below then we will say another value we will i'll discuss that later how it is said okay that will we will discuss in x ray for now you remember all these values when does head of femur appear one year for female also one year fusion will be male 16 to 19 and female 14 to 15 years so this is as per goldstone chart goldstone chart g a l s t a u n goldstone chart so <clears throat> why this name is important is because the uh, he conducted this study on bengali population as we are in west bengal so this is accepted in high court calcutta high court <clears throat> legally accepted other charts other states other persons might have done so according to them if you are in up you will follow some different chart if you are in mumbai they will their population will be having their values <clears throat> this is for bengal goldstone chart because if i give you all the charts <laughs> it's impossible to uh, finish the class so this chart is for bengali population well accepted and in exam also you will be 
writing uh, the age from this chart only stager <coughs> age hoye gelo boja gelo ki kore korte hobe sob kichu fuse hoye geche to shei jonno oto bolchi na onek shomoy lege jabe stager <coughs> stager also i told you how to find the stager we will put the bone in the osteometric board other hand slide korlam ja reading pelam <coughs> into multiplication multiplication factor <coughs> what are the multiplication factor this study has been done by pan pan one forensic medicine expert okay pan then there is nath siddiqui and shaw these anthropologists they have done the anthropological studies for the Beng uh, population that which included bengali bihari and odisha people so this one you should remember because these bones are i guess from west bengal itself okay so the multiplication factor would be <clears throat> 3.82 for males and 3.08 for females okay males females this you must remember shop theke easy kore dilam anahade aru complicated ache so what will you do is you will put that thing in the osteometric board whatever you get into 3.82 For male in female into 3.08, you will get this stature. The stature pay के लिए तो बोलते बार भी जे उड़ा male ना female मोटा मोटी बोलते बार भी. तार परे उस तके stature उस तके की बोले race बोलते बार इस आर के की बोल दा बजाय. ठीक है चल. So stature is equal to length into femur into multiplication factor plus constant. এখানে আমরা আর কনস্ট্যান্ট দিচ্ছি না এটা 3.2 দিয়ে হয়ে যাবে অন্য এগুলোতে অন্যগুলিতে কনস্ট্যান্ট লাগে যেমন এই দুটো দিস টু দিস অ্যানথ্রোপোলজিস্ট কার্ল পিয়ারসন এন্ড ট্রটার এন্ড গ্লেসার দিস দিস অ্যানথ্রোপোলজিস্ট ডিড স্টাডি অন ইউরোপিয়ান পপুলেশন ওকে সো দে हैव सम কনস্ট্যান্ট ফর স্পেসিফিক রেসেস ইফ ইট ইজ ককেশিয়ানস देयर উইল বি আ কনস্ট্যান্ট मींस ইট উইল বি some constant some value for negroids there will be some value for mongoloids there will be some value so this is for carl pearson and trotter cross uh, glesa the there will be constant some constant for this pan uh, you can just multiply and you will get it okay for soft tissue you will add some 2.5 cent, uh, cm to it soft tissue the bone length you will get plus 2.5 cm for soft tissue Nath, this is for UP, Uttar Pradesh population. Siddiqui and Shaw for Punjabis. These are uh, uh, the means same as Pan. These these are also uh, anthropologists who did study on those populations. Okay. This one is the important one. The best long bone to find stature is femur. Question. Okay. <coughs> so we'll sum it up. Findings. so uh, that thing whatever you get dried and devoid of soft tissue then it is massive or less massive whatever is markings are prominent or not then metric part head is this neck is this obtuse or whatever it is then we will say uh, it is of a male or female in the down part uh, in the findings it is a male or female femur then comes opinion from physical examination of the specimen provided to me in my in my opinion the bone is of human origin it is a male or female femur it is aged above ato and less than ato okay other things we will add to this opinion is race injury is there or not so that will be this part so we have covered race sex age injuries injuries what you will write if there are no injuries no injuries you will write no injuries if there are injuries what could be the injuries first one is if there is a cut injury or a fracture or a uh, what you call chop wound it will form injuries chop wound because chop wound uh, it breaks the continuity of the bone okay <clears throat> whether it's burnt or not 
not burned, no injuries. Stains. Stains means whether there is any blood mark or there or not, whether in any tattooing is there or not, whether any, uh, what do you call, <clears throat> uh, pen mark is there or not, ink mark, ink mark. If ink mark is there, what does the students do? Medical students. They will draw on the bone, they will write the muscle name, insertion and all. So we can say that it is, uh, um, this bone has been studied by some doctors or somebody, so it's not medical legally relevant. <clears throat> Stature are done. Disease, what disease can be there? Rickets, syphilis, we can find them. Heavy metal poisoning, okay, what else? Any bone malignancy is there or not? Those things. Disease over, deformity, same only. Disease and deformity, same. Uh, then scurvy also. Some time since death and cause of death. These two are again important. So what is time since death? <coughs> Suppose within six months, within six months, the bone will be how will you say that the uh, bone is, uh, bone, uh, the person has died within six months. So we, the, the bones appear and which will be like, there will be soft tissue attached to it. Then there, may, there will be, it will greasy in appearance. There will be uh, foul smell within six months. After six months, what will happen is, the soft tissue will more uh, decompose and then only the uh, little bit of ligaments or attachments will be there. So it will be like six months to one year. In one year, uh, the whole uh, whole bone is gets dried and there will be no attachment to it after one year. After that also, we can uh, find the age of the bone. Uh, first is by the nitrogen content of the bone. Nitrogen content is about 4.5% in a living bone. Okay. Till one year, it is about 4.5% gradually it decreases nitrogen content of the bone 4.5 thick out of comte comte 4.2 it takes about 200 years to come to 4.2 percent nitrogen so other one uh, this is night by nitrogen content another one is by uh, will make a cross section at the uh, diaphysis part then we see the appearance by uh, uh, what do you call so <clears throat> when we make a cut section on the diaphysal end you get like this so when we uh, <clears throat> uh, what do you call when a UV fluorescent light is applied to it UV fluorescent light what happens this this is a fresh one okay fresh this is marrow cavity <clears throat> so when we uh, put the uh, UV light on it, the whole thing, the bluish, uh, it, if it gives bluish appearance, then it is fresh. Gradually, the fluorescence decreases. Okay. So, gradually, you see the outer, this is the outer and this is the medial, middle. So, from the outer also it will decrease, from the middle also it will decrease. Okay. So, in after maybe uh, around 20 to 30 decades, this will uh, shrink. The bluish appearance will shrink both from the outer cortex and from the middle. So, later on, as it gradually increases, it will be like a thin band. Okay, this is marrow cavity, this is thin band. Means as, it, as the bone ages, Joto puro no hai yabe bone, Toto bluish appearance ta kume yabe. This is by UV fluorescence. We can state the time since death. Okay. The first one was nitrogen content method. Second was UV fluorescence method. Fresher it is. The less blue means older bone. Nitrogen content 4.5 percent se decrease hoga. 4.5 se 4.2. Then it may gradually decrease more also. Now coming to uh, what else is there? Carbon dating, time since death can be given by carbon dating, that is a huge difference, means it will be like in uh, 
uh, centuries, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, 500 years, like fossils, okay, that is done by carbon dating. So don't just when the examiner asks you, start with carbon dating. Carbon dating is in the end you will say carbon dating. First you will say by the, that those morphological things, whether it's greasy in appearance, soft tissue is there or not, ligaments are attached or not. If it is there, then it's less than one year. If foul smell is there, less than six months. And uh, then after one year, nitrogen content method, UV fluorescence method. Done. Five out of five. Okay, if you can answer like that. Now coming, cause of death. Cause of death, just as I told you, by the injuries, we can say whether if, if there was chop wound or not, you can say death may be due to the effects of uh, chop wound or if it, if it was burned then, burned, uh, if there was poison in the bone, like heavy metals poison, heavy metal poison, arsenic, lead, all those things get deposited in hair, in bones, okay, nails, that Napoleon, you know Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, so that guy was poisoned by arsenic, so how do you know? After uh, so many years, we uh, performed a uh, means, uh, test and from his hair samples, we found that he was poisoned, slow poisoning by arsenic. Okay. So, cause, uh, cause of death can be determined. So, we have covered everything. Okay. For all bones, it will be almost similar. Only the metric part will change. Skull dimension, whatever it is, 30, 60, 40, 60, 90, 70, 60 all those. Pelvis also, I will take later on pelvis, that also I will explain what are the things important. So we have covered.